the title of this talk is Where is the Death Penalty in the United States Heading? The Many Alton Countervailing Trends. And I take that from the fact that much of what I'm going to be saying, most of it, is going to be giving you an overview of where things stood about a year ago, where the trends were then. And most of what I will talk about after introducing where we had started with, with where we have come and what may happen in the future. But I first thought I would just briefly mention that I did not uh, begin my life or even begin my career intent upon working on the issue of the death penalty. Uh, nothing could be further away from what I had in mind. And when, uh, after I've been practicing law for uh, eight or nine years, uh, I got permission from my firm to do a lot more pro bono work, we contacted the NAACP Legal Defense Fund because of their great work in civil rights, having no intention of doing anything remotely like death penalty. But they told me that uh, the biggest need for me to help is in the death penalty, and that uh, even though I had never argued any criminal case in any court, uh, and particularly not any appeals court, uh, that because there was no right to have a lawyer represent you if you were on death row and didn't have funds for a lawyer after your first appeal, that they needed to have volunteers to do these appeals. And they said, I was the most qualified person in the country who was available, despite having no relevant experience, to do this appeal. So the first case they had was in the 11th Circuit, and the appeal brief was due one week later. And I never heard of any of the issues they were dealing with. But they said, look, they're not going to give you an extension of time, which they didn't. This is already in the federal appeals court in Atlanta. But with the help of a North Carolinian, John Charles Boger, who some of you I hope know of, who is at University of North Carolina uh, in, the North, in the law area, um, I was able to muddle through, get the briefs in, do the oral argument, and then we won the case by a, a unanimous vote in the 11th Circuit, and then the United States Supreme Court took the case, which is not what you want to have happen if you won in the court below. But I went to the Legal Defense Fund again. I said, well, now I've had a tiny amount of experience, but uh, this is going to affect a lot of people. Don't stand on ceremony. And they said, no, we want you to handle this in the Supreme Court. So in 1984, about a year and a half after I first began working on that first death penalty case, I was arguing it in the Supreme Court of the United States. And I won't go through all the sturm und drang that occurred there, but what I will say is that um, we were able to win on an issue that involves the word presumption and rebuttal and whether the jury understood them and what case outcome would have been different if they had used uh, inference or some other such wording. In any event, we got the five to four victory. Uh, that client's life was saved, but if, with all the procedural changes they've made since then, uh, we wouldn't even be able to get a ruling on any part of that claim today. I think. But what I did do is that several of the people who helped me prepare for the briefing and particularly the oral argument of that case, then started to ask me to get involved in some other cases. And I did, but I also began to realize that uh, although I had never been for the death penalty, I had no conception of all of the unfairnesses in the way it operates. And I felt that I had a special ability since I was not working for a group that required that I had to take on more and more of these cases, although I did take on some, that I should try to write about the subject and speak about the subject and join professional organizations to deal with the subject to try to let people know what was actually happening. Because the, the bill of goods that uh, the Supreme Court had tried to sell people and others had is that we had now, after having thrown out all death sentences in 1972 in the entire country, in a case called Furman, uh, in part because there was no rhyme or reason as to who got the death penalty. Uh, one of the justices said it was like being hit by a stroke of lightning. 
they were now claiming that the new laws that they upheld in 76 uh, had made things fair. And so I learned to my satisfaction, or actually dissatisfaction, that they had not accomplished that. So here are then some of the things that when I wrote a year ago, I was saying were trends as of right before the pandemic started in March of last year. Public support for the death penalty had declined to its lowest level in many decades. The Gallup polls actually found a higher percentage of people favoring life without parole as being the most serious punishment or compared to the percentage who favored the death penalty. Um, this trend accelerated further when district attorneys uh, who sought and secured death penalties far more than their counterparts uh, elsewhere were defeated for re-election or were otherwise replaced by more moderate district attorneys. The trend I'm talking about is now not goes beyond the public opinion trend, but is toward a lower degree of seeking of the death penalty and a lesser uh, desire to carry out death penalties that already existed because they came to believe based on many experiences of people reinvestigating cases that in a substantial number of cases where people had ended up on death row, some of them were not guilty of the crime at all, and others who were guilty had not had important defenses presented such as mental illness, uh, what was then called mental retardation, now called intellectual disability, um, other traumatic things that may have happened to people, uh, ineffectual trial counsel and the like. Um, there was also, as of a year ago, a greater number of people were aware of the historic basis or background of this country's executions, which have been mostly in the South. There's an outgrowth of lynchings, and uh, it was felt by some, including some judges, that lynchings didn't really give the right impression of the Southern way of life or uh, what they wanted to convey. And so they should make it look better by having trials uh, instead. And uh, this, uh, I'll explain later some of the things that have helped the understanding of this to become greater, but there also began to be a greater understanding of the truism that a human being's life must be assessed by considering much more than the worst thing he or she ever did. And the way these cases have been tried when they first started doing them told you almost nothing about uh, the rest of what they had done in their life. And also, even if they did put in evidence about that, uh, the instructions that the judges gave to the juries were often worded in such a way that they either didn't think it made any difference what they were learning, or for something like mental disability or mental illness, they actually, many juries, thought that was a factor in favor of the death penalty, because if you have mental illness, let's say, they felt that you would be more likely to kill again. So it was not presented in a way that would comport with the way the law would want it to be considered. Um, that had begun to change, but not enough. Now, one of the basic things then that I uh, had concluded as uh, a factual pattern as of March of last year, he said whether one got the death penalty or got executed depended far less on how bad the defendant's conduct was, and far more on the quality of the defense counsel, the prosecutor's attitude on when to seek the death penalty, the extent of prosecutorial and police misconduct, and defense counsel's failure to make objections at times when the law required them to be made, which often led to later lawyers in the case not being able to correct anything. Uh, this is a major point um, that uh, was illustrated by some of the cases that we faced in the last year, 
uh, where it's very clear that some of the less culpable people wound up getting executed and some of the more culpable did not. For those who may recall the case of the host of the uh, Ted Bundy as being an example of if you're ever going to get the worst of the worst to be executed, he was it. But it so happens that Ted Bundy was offered a life sentence. The only reason he got executed by Florida is that he turned down the life sentence. Um, so that doesn't exactly prove that the worst of the worst will always get it. In fact, sometimes the jury doesn't impose it like they didn't for the Hillside Strangler. In the Atlanta case where the judge was killed right in the courtroom, um, they did not impose the death penalty or the sort. So, and yet some of the people who do get the death penalty, uh, it's very dubious that they, that they were guilty in the first place. In any event, let's then go on into what has happened in the last year. One of the things is that the last execution in this country by a state is, was Texas's execution on July 8th of last year. Much to my surprise, uh, even though I've been very involved in everything going on since then, a lot of things, no state has done any execution since then. Several, as I will mention later, made noises about resuming executions, uh, but none has done it thus far. On the other hand, the United States government, which had approximately uh, 70 or 80 people at most who had been sentenced to death over a period of years and had never executed anybody for 20 years or so, decided during the administration of William Barr as Attorney General and of President Trump, they decided that they were going to get over the fact that they had not been able to come up with a satisfactory method of lethal injection that the court would bless. Uh, and they were just going to go ahead and try to get the courts to accept whatever they were going to throw together as a method of execution. And they were going to try to execute as many people as they could in, as long as the president was president. And having executed nobody for 20 years, they, between July of last year and a few days before the president left office in January of this year, they sought to and succeeded in executing 13 federal death row inmates. This is the first time in our history that the federal government executed more people than any, than all the states put together. Um, the Many of these people who were executed had substantial bases for arguments as to that they should get a new consideration. Uh, for example, did they have um, mental disability, which if they did, should have precluded them from being executed. Uh, and some had claims of innocence, some had claims of mental incompetence to be executed, uh, some have claims they were so mentally ill at the time of the crime that they could not be found to have been so responsible uh, that they could be executed. But none of these 13 inmates were granted relief on their constitutional claims. And why is that? Well, best as I can determine, it was failure of the earlier lawyers in these cases to object at the time prescribed for making such objections and assertions by the state, by the federal courts, that even if their constitutional claims were assumed to be meritorious, the constitutional error was insufficiently serious to grant relief. But in many of these cases, and in those cases where the Supreme Court was asked to take action, where a lower court had asked to have a hearing or even ordered a hearing, the U.S. Supreme Court almost always reversed, and uh, they uh, often did that at the last minute without any uh, explanation. Um, and there often was no time uh, to prepare for anything else that might come up. Um, the 
guiding principle in the Supreme Court in this period seemed to be that uh, we needed to get these cases over with while President Trump was still president. Uh, even a normal German to consider a new issue, if we would take the execution, we would take the case past January 20th, they weren't going to allow because they had indications from the Biden campaign's opposition to the federal death penalty uh, that if they didn't execute them before January 20th, they may not ever get executed. Uh, now, um, there was no explanation ever given as to how they picked the 13 people they picked out of the 62 or so, unless the number that I mentioned before, 62 who were on the federal death row. The Supreme Court and the appeals courts were also not moved by evidence that death row inmates facing execution within weeks or even days had become ill with the COVID-19 virus, as had many prison officials and others who came in there to attend or take part in executions, or even the press. Um, they, again, did not want to postpone it past the 20th. Now, the president's the new president's view on this is interesting in that he was actually the chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee, or at least a prominent member, in a period of time in the 1980s and 90s when the federal death penalty was greatly expanded. Uh, so his new position is very notable shift. Um, the Supreme Court, in its attitude on these cases, is certainly being affected by the most recent people who have been added to the Supreme Court, with Trump having added three, court is certainly uh, much more conservative than it was before. Now, what are some of the other things, if any, that resulted from this federal series of executions? Well, one thing that happened almost simultaneously with the end of the federal executions is that Virginia abolished the death penalty in March and then it was signed into law in April. Um, the, uh, in the decades since they started executing again in 1976, Virginia had executed 113 people, which is more than any other state besides Texas. And if you go back to the colonial period, Virginia has executed more people than any other colony slash state in the country. However, it had turned more the juries there and prosecutors had in recent years uh, with better defense lawyering, not been sentencing too many people to death anymore. There are only two people left on the death row. But what is it about the year 2021 that caused them to enact the law this year? Well, the New York Times reported that there seems to have been some urgency created in Virginia by these federal executions. Uh, one of the Democratic candidates for governor said she had heard more from people saying it's time to end the death penalty during these federal executions than I've heard before, and that the rash of executions just put the issue front and center for people some would not have thought about before. A leading supporter of the bill, a Republican state senator named Scott Surville, said that the nexus between lynchings of black men and the death penalty's advent is undeniable. He said that by abolishing the death penalty, Virginia could again become a world leader as a society, as a government that values civil rights. And the fact that Virginia did that is suggestive of the belief that the death penalty is no longer perceived as a magic elixir by candidates in any part of the country, even in the South, and it's undoubtedly true in some places, but uh, it's no longer the case in a place like Virginia that opposition to the death penalty is a political death sentence. As the public has learned more and more about the death penalty system as it is implemented, public officials and political candidates have found it much easier to support abolition, a moratorium, or measures to limit the worst features of capital punishment. Now, another thing that 
seems to have been spurred on by these federal executions, was an effort announced on March 18th by business leaders, including um, Richard Branson of Virgin Group and a variety of others, in which they issued a joint letter condemning capital punishment and urged other business leaders to join what they called an international fight against racism. Many observers credited former President Trump for focusing attention on the way that capital punishment is a leading manifestation of, quote, lethal white on black violence, albeit under the guise of due process. President Trump, according to these reporters, inadvertently persuaded many business leaders that their efforts against racism should include opposition to the death penalty, which they had not had on the list before that. And there has also been activity by Republicans in state legislatures. Some of them, as did the state senator I mentioned a minute or two ago, have been voting for abolition. And there are growing number who are. But there was a report on April 15th, a week ago, by the Marshall Project that an increasing number of Republican legislators, if they are not prepared to vote for abolition, are now calling for reforms of the capital punishment, such as an exclusion of people with the severe mental illness at the time of the crime, um, which had not gotten anywhere until this year when Ohio enacted that into law. It's the first state that did it. Um, and it also was apparently the case that Democrats are much more uniformly opposed to capital punishment than they were a few decades ago. It's not completely unanimous, but it's close. Now, what we have also seen is a continuation of the trend in that it can't be said that in those states that have abolished the death penalty, which since 2003 have included New York, New Jersey, New Mexico, Illinois, Maryland, and several others, uh, including this year uh, after having had New Hampshire, we've got Colorado, um, and then we have Virginia. Uh, there's no indication that any of the horrible things that the proponents of the death penalty said would happen if you ever got rid of it, as apparently happened in these states, and there has been no great outcry to that effect. So now I think that Ohio deserves a few minutes of attention because uh, it has a state that is no longer a swing state. It's a deeply Republican state, at least at the presidential level. And uh, it's not a significant death row, one of the six largest, I think, in the country. But they have had a number of developments uh, beginning in late 2020 before the pandemic, well, after the pandemic came in, but which followed steps that Governor DeWine, a Republican, began even before the pandemic. Basically, he said he would not allow any execution to go forward until the legislature passed a bill providing that executions be carried out other than by lethal injection. And he said uh, earlier this month that he was postponing the three remaining scheduled executions for this year in light of their fact that they had not come up with a satisfactory way to execute. One of the things he is worried about is if they were to emulate some other states that I'll mention in a few minutes and got surreptitiously some other drugs that they might, the state of Ohio might find itself unable to buy for lawful purposes some drugs from some of these drug companies. Uh, but what also happened was that on January 9th, as I mentioned, the governor signed the bill that dealt with mental illness and the death penalty and despite opposition by many prosecutors, the bill passed the House in Ohio by 76 to 18, and in the Senate by 27 to 3. So these were not close. Um, these adopt recommendations by a joint task force that I happen to chair of the American Bar Association, Psychiatric Association, and Psychological Association back in 2006. And we're hopeful that it will be, make progress in some other states. 
And there's been some movement in Tennessee and some other places. Then there became a movement to actually abolish the death penalty in Ohio, which was supported by a public opinion poll showing that the majority of both Democrats and Republicans favored abolition. And a new abolition bill was proposed by more Republicans than ever before and by Democrats. Uh, they gave a variety of reasons uh, why they would change their mind. I can go into that if time permits, if people ask. But notably, an op-ed was published within the last month or so, where Republican former Governor Robert Taft and a former Republican Attorney General and a former Democratic Attorney General of Ohio, who had all supported the Ohio death penalty law 40 years ago when it was enacted, said they all think it should be abolished. Um, political observers say the chances of it passing are much greater than the past, but not sure thing. Meanwhile, in California, we have a moratorium on executions imposed by their governor, and it's trying to get some other reforms in place. Um, but then we get to states that said they were going to resume executions but haven't done it yet. Um, this includes Oklahoma, which was once the second most prolific executioner in the United States, but by this beginning of this year, it had gone six years since its last execution, in which the wrong drug was used to execute Charles Warner. And that followed the botched execution of Clayton Lockett in 2014 and preceded multiple failed attempts to execute Richard Blossom, who, since they didn't manage to execute him, remains on that road. In 2018, Oklahoma announced that it would switch from lethal injection to another method, uh, both because it was unpopular and because Oklahoma had found it increasingly difficult to get the drugs it needed to use in executions. <clears throat> but then surprisingly, last year, Oklahoma officials said that they had found the supply of the drugs and would be able to resume executions whenever the courts would permit them. Um, the court had required that they not execute anybody in the meantime. In 2020, a state representative, Kevin McDougall, proposed that a death penalty conviction be reviewable if the inmate presented a plausible claim of actual innocence supported by information or evidence not previously presented, and if the innocence claim is able to be investigated and resolved. And that is something the law doesn't really allow in most places. And this year, in fact, in this month, he expressed concern that they might go ahead and execute Mr. Glossop before the legislature enacts the law that would allow there to be a further investigation of Saxon's case. Now, I was now going to turn to some of the factors that have been discovered in the past, but have been further caused the people to think about changing their minds about fairness to the death penalty and the accuracy of it. Um, one is the belated discovery that the prosecution has relied on either erroneous DNA analysis or other proof that turned out to be junk science. Um, in one case, uh, Arely Escobar in Texas. Uh, late last year, a judge recommended that the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals vacate his murder and rape convictions and death sentences. And he found that all of the relevant parts of the government responsible for overseeing the DNA lab in Travis County had failed to properly supervise it and did not take effective action against a person at the lab who gave unscientific, unfounded, false testimony, which even that witness agrees was unfounded, unscientific, and false. Uh, we don't yet have a ruling on that from the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals. There is even an effort in the case of somebody named Sudley All Alley, who Tennessee executed in 2006. So he has been dead for 15 years uh, on charges that he raped and had murdered someone. But his own daughter asked that the state courts conduct posthumous DNA testing. And uh, that is still being considered 
by the courts. The, it's a case in which there is every indication, according to Duke, called the Innocence Project, that the kind of things that we have seen in other cases where someone has been exonerated may well be too, true of this case, uh, but they have a strong tendency against looking into cases where the person is an executed. Another phenomenon which I touched upon earlier, uh, but accelerated in 2020, is that reform-minded prosecutors have been elected in a number of places. One example is Los Angeles, where the San Francisco district attorney moved to Los Angeles to run against the Los Angeles district attorney who had gotten about 200 people sent to California's death row. Well, the one Gaston who had been in San Francisco was elected. He now intends to review the dense sentences that the offices, office had previously secured. And there are numerous other places where uh, people elected new people. And one of the reasons why the Escobar case, which I was just talking about, from Travis County, Texas, has been looked into is because of a change in who the DA is. But there has been then a new controversy in that in the state of Missouri, there has been a new St. Louis elected prosecutor, Tim Gardner, who wants to reopen the case of death row inmate Lamar Johnston. She has the support in doing this of 34 elected prosecutors throughout the United States who thought that he should get a new trial in which the prosecution would present new evidence that might result in acquittal. Because in the 24 years that he's been on death row, the lead prosecution witness who canted and two other men confessed to having committed a crime by themselves. It went up to the Missouri Supreme Court and they held in March of this year that there was no precedent to allow the new prosecutor to make this attack this many years after the case, even though the person's still alive. But in two very strong concurring opinions, the chief judge of the court and one of the other members of the court said that the position taken on this case by the attorney general's office was disingenuous uh, and that maybe the legislature can provide a way for the, the new prosecutor in St. Louis to look into this case. This apparently has gone on in several other parts of the country. There have, there, the state executions that there were, with which there were only seven last year, um, and seven a year before, I believe, uh, are continuing despite substantial reasons to doubt guilt in some of these cases. And I've mentioned some of the examples of that. But there are also two people with very strong innocence claims who just barely escaped being executed in 2019 and 2020, they still get it. I'll talk about one of them briefly. James Daly of Florida um, managed to stay alive uh, on procedural grounds, having nothing to do with his innocence claim. But what had happened in recent years is that his co-defendant had admitted at least four different times, including a signed affidavit in 2017, that the co-defendant had alone committed the murder, no physical evidence linked daily to the crime, and the only testimony against him had come from the co-defendant, who was sentenced to life in prison. And three jailhouse informants to whom the police provided information about the murders and had the charges against them reduced. That's pretty easy to be a jailhouse informant if the police gave you the evidence that you then are providing us with supposed new information. An extensive story based on the reporting of a New York Times staff writer and ProPublica reporter was published in the Times Magazine on December, in December 2019. It revealed that one of the jailhouse informant witnesses, Paul Skalnick, was a serial perjurer whose testimony had put dozens of defendants in jail, including four on death row. And uh, in February of last year, the judge ordered that an evidentiary hearing be held at which Piercy, the co-defendant, could testify. But he refused to testify. Um, so in May of last year, 
the judge denied Mr. Daly's innocence claim. Ironically, the day before that, the journalist who had written most about this case received the National Magazine Award for expose of this informant. Stay tuned, there may be more yet to happen in that. Now, there also have been a number of cases which happened this year in which death row inmates, either who were still on death row or had been on death row earlier, with strong indicia of innocence have been released. Now, one of these is somebody that the state was in had even forgotten that he was still on death row after decades. Finally, they discovered it. And in most of these cases, what they do in order to not appear to have been admitting that they had actually put innocent people on death row is to get them to make a plea where they're not saying, I agree I was guilty, but they're saying, well, I will not contest your showing of guilt if you return to the letting me out on time served. And that's what's happened with a number of people. Um, but uh, in addition to that happening and more people being aware of that, there was enhanced public awareness that even long accepted types of evidence can lead to erroneous convictions and death sentences. A Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, Edward Hughes, or Hughes, wrote in the LA Times in 2019 that the science of bite mark comparisons, ballistic comparisons, fingerprint matching, blood spatter analysis, arson investigation, and other common forensic techniques has been tainted by systematic error, cognitive bias, sometimes called tunnel vision, and little or no research or data to support some of these methods. He said there is, in short, very little science behind some of the correct forensic, quote, sciences used in court to imprison and sometimes execute people. DNA exposed many of these errors, and then the highly critical report from the National Academy of Sciences in 2009 found a dearth of scientific backing from more the most forensic methods other than DNA. That was then followed by an even more blistering presidential commission report in 2016, which found serious errors and junk science in a host of commonly used forensic methods tying suspects to crimes. And this even affected the supposedly infallible fingerprint evidence. There are, in particular, a number of cases that have now found problems even in Texas, where they rarely gave anybody relief, with bite mark evidence, which often has turned out not to be the bite mark, the bite mark created by the defendant, as was being claimed. Sometimes it's not even a bite mark at all, but if it is, it's often not the defendant. Um, and then there is something that in our pro bono program we have dealt with, but we haven't dealt with it in a death penalty context yet, but we actually we did recently and we got some relief. This is the so-called shaken baby murder diagnosis where uh, somebody will come in and they will claim that the parent uh, must have shaken the baby in such a way that it caused the death. And this is now after years and years in which the tax on the shaken baby evidence have been poo pooed. Uh, now there have been a number of rulings that, in particular cases and particular circumstances, have said that it's not valid. And um, that is one that has been used in some cases with people on death row. Now, if you think back to who was defending these cases, if the defense and even the prosecution had no reason to think that these experts coming in from the FBI lab or wherever they were coming from, uh, there could possibly be anything wrong with any of these kinds of evidence, then they may not have mounted much of a defense. And yet, that does not detract from the fact that many of the clients were innocent. Now, aside from that, there have been executions, I won't go to chapter and verse, of people sentenced to death in violation of the Constitution or whose executions raised serious fairness issues. But I will give one or two examples. Texas executed Billy Cobble, Cobble in February 2019, despite federal court findings that two prosecution expert witnesses have provided problematic and fabricated 
testimony about his supposed future dangerousness, um, one of them that they relied on was psychiatric testimony from Dr. Richard Coombs, who based his conclusion of future dangerousness on his assessing the case, quote, his way with his own methodology without ever checking the evidence's accuracy. Um, someone else provided false testimony about the prevalence of prison violence and loopholes in prison rules that he claimed would allow the life sentence prisoners to commit act of violence. The Fifth Circuit, which denied relief, allowed the man to be executed, noted that the state does not dispute these parts, that, that parts of his expert testimony were fabricated. Um, and although a finding that the prisoner poses a continuing threat to society is a precondition to a, fine, to a death sentence in Texas, the federal courts ruled that this was all harmless error. Um, and then there was one in the Sandra Woods in Alabama, which was upsetting for a lot of reasons, including the fact that two jurors thought he should get a uh, life sentence, but they were overridden. Now, in the continuing concerns about lethal injection, I'll simply mention that there are some prisoners in some states who now have a choice, like Tennessee, they have been choosing the electric chair rather than lethal injection. South Carolina is considering offering the firing squad. And meanwhile, Arizona now claims it has sufficient drugs to execute by lethal injection, but it also has been reported by the Guardian newspaper that they surreptitiously paid $1.5 million to buy enough pentobarbital to execute almost twice its tetro population. They had previously tried illegally importing execution drugs only to be stopped by the federal government. And apparently Tennessee and Missouri have secretively and expensively procured and used execution drugs from abroad. And as I've said, the Supreme Court has in recent years show no interest in these kinds of claims. And uh, I would just say that uh, it's the only thing that seems to be in common between what lethal injection is understood to mean when the Supreme Court upholds its unconstitutionality about 10 or 12 years ago and lethal injection today are the two words, lethal and injection, but how they go about doing it, which drugs they use, uh, everything else about it is considerably different. Now, one exception to the trend of fewer death sentences and laws making them less likely that more death sentences or executions is Florida, where after a Supreme Court of the United States ruling suggested that they needed to go back and reconsider a lot of the death sentences, Governor DeSantis figured out a way to point new judges to replace three of the judges who had been on their court when they did that. And now they said they're changing all sorts of laws to make them even worse than before the U.S. Supreme Court acted. So that is a place, Florida, where we may wind up with more executions and more death sentences. The last major topic I wanted to talk about, since I know time is short, is the greater understanding of the interrelationship of the death penalty with racial superiority, ideology, and lynching. Many of you are probably aware of a name in Vinci, the National Memorial for Peace and Justice and the Legacy Museum in Montgomery, Alabama, developed by Brian Stevenson and Equal Justice. That and the success of the movies and the book Just Mercy have led people to begin to understand that we are still suffering from the dreadful legacy of which is one of the main points of the museum and the memorial and other terrorism that rendered the post-slavery constitutional amendments and federal civil rights laws a practical melody. Um, and most Americans until the last few years had very little idea of the continuity of white supremacy as an ideology through the present and of the post-traumatic impact that lynchings still have to many communities of color, including Northern communities of color in which enormous migrations occurred. And then in the last year, there has been an increasing awareness of and outrage about killings of unarmed black people by police. 
which I discovered to my amazement this last week, there are more killings of black people in this country by police who are unarmed, not the police are unarmed, but the black people are unarmed, than there are executions in this country at the current time, given how we have cut back so greatly on executions. By early 2021, the national awareness of and videotape contemporary and evidence went, reached a crescendo for reasons of became the more apparent this week. On January 25th, NPR presented the results of its investigation into the large number of police killings of law-abiding Black people. The results were extremely dismaying, um, and one would hope that there will be reforms made. But then we had a subsequently released video of a dreadful incident in Virginia on December 5th of last year, which fortunately did not end up in anyone being killed, but it highlights some police officers' ingrained biases, including manifestations to the use of execution-related words. In this situation, as you probably have heard about, seen, they had a confrontation with an active duty Army second lieutenant, Karen Nazaro, Nazario, who was in uniform because his new SUV didn't have new license plates so he did have the temporary ones. In the course of dealing with him, um, in which after they knew that he was an Army second lieutenant, they pepper sprayed, struck and handcuffed him, et cetera. Uh, they stated that uh, they used language uh, that uh, came from wording that was used in a movie with Tom Hanks about an execution. They used some code words for uh, executing people. So that parallel was affecting the verbiage, at least, of one of the police officers. Now, how does this relate to the Supreme Court? Well, the Supreme Court, starting with the McCleskey case in 1987, had taken the view that even if you presented statistically valid proof of racial disparities based on race and the imposition of the death penalty, uh, that that wasn't enough to get relief because uh, we can't, we, if we gave relief on that, it would call into question our entire criminal justice system. But in the last two years, there have been a few cases where Chief Justice Roberts in particular has indicated in effect that if you find a smoking gun evidence of racial discrimination, and there's no way to deny it, then maybe you'll be able to get relief. And one of these cases is the case of a man named Dwayne Buck, whose own lawyer put on an expert who said that Buck, the defendant's race, is a disturbing departure. Well, said the race is a reason to believe he would be dangerous in the future because he couldn't change from being black, so no matter how he would reform, it made him more dangerous. Um, the court said that this was very troubling because discrimination in race is particularly egregious in the criminal justice system. Consideration of race in that context injures not just the defendant, but the law as an institution and the community at large and the democratic ideal. That language seemed to me to be quite different from the wording and holding of the custody. 30 years earlier. Now, on the subject of race, there have been some very unusual developments in North Carolina, where, as you may know, there was a Racial Justice Act, the first in the country to be enacted. It was then an appeal. Some people had gotten relief under it, had the relief taken away. But then, in the last year or so, the North Carolina Supreme Court said that while they were not resuscitating it as the future cases, for the people who it could have given relief to while it existed, they had to reconsider relief to them, and they've been doing that. Um, internationally, the report, the figures from the report issued this week by Amnesty International, which every year reports on the international trends in the death penalty, and once again, the United States is the only country in the Western Hemisphere to have any executions. Uh, we are somewhere between 9th and 12th in having the most executions in any country. They have a vote on a resolution calling for a moratorium on executions and for 
abolition over time, that now got a vote in last December of 123 in favor, 36 including the United States against, and 32 abstaining. The numbers who favor that keep going up. Um, I could tell you what some of the countries have changed their minds are, but uh, it's going up and up. And the number of countries that are actually executing is going down. Um, other important issues, which I'll just mention without discussing them, are the various procedural door closing things like the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act, which makes it almost impossible to get rulings to come up. Um, and the fact that clemency proceedings, which could be a, should be a fail state against the inability to get claims heard otherwise, have become nothing of the sort in most places. In one case, however, in Ohio in 2018, Governor Kasich gave clemency to someone who was scheduled to be executed because he might have been innocent and he certainly, uh, they had used phony facts against him. Uh, there Occasionally people with mental illness claims have gotten clemency, but not often. But what's most typical of how horrible the case may be for upholding an execution, and yet you still have an execution, is the case of Jeffrey Wood uh, in 20, December 2017. The Texas District Attorney, Luke, Lucy Wilk, District Attorney, supported clemency for Mr. Wood, whose conviction and sentence she had secured herself almost two decades earlier. So this is not the case of a new prosecutor trying to undo a death sentence to someone else who was trying to, trying to undo her own one. Although he was the getaway driver, he was not present when the murder occurred and denied knowing that his federal robber would kill anyone. And he was convicted and sentenced under the so-called law of parties, where the jury could have made him likely to be, to be as dangerous as anybody else who was actually involved, even though his whole history was nonviolence. In addition to the prosecutor, the chief of police and a district judge who was presiding over a challenge over the use of expert testimony over future dangerousness also called upon parole board to give him clemency, but they wouldn't consider it. And the district court uh, at one point did recommend that relief be granted uh, because they found that the government, one of their experts, so-called Dr. Death, Dr. Jane Grigson, had given false and misleading testimony about Wood's supposed future dangerousness. But Texas Court of Criminal Appeals reversed, even though there was some dissent, and uh, his death sentence was upheld. Now, one can make an equitable argument for clemency that one would hope somebody would grant. There are several that you can make. I'll just mention one or two. And that is that many of the people who are now being executed were brought to trial at a time where life without parole did not exist as an alternative to the death penalty. And there have been plenty of people who served on juries who have said, well, if it had existed, we would have voted for that and not for the death penalty. They didn't really think the death penalty was warranted, but they thought the only choice was letting the person out on parole within a few years, which it really wasn't, but no one would tell them that. Um, but another thing is that um, you have had in North Carolina, for example, it's one of the rare ones, the prosecutors for many years had no discretion as to whether to seek the death penalty. They had to seek it regardless of what they might have otherwise opted to do. Um, that was different for most states. That policy was later changed and gave them discretion. And once they had the discretion, the number of death penalties that they sought went well down. Well, you might then think, well, somebody who was sentenced when this earlier policy had been in effect, might be able to seek clemency on the ground that they might well not have gotten the death penalty had this happened, but that has not yet succeeded. And finally, uh, I would say that the fact that there are now, in addition to prosecutors who were handling cases differently, um, that there are, and there are whole colonies that used to be leaders in seeking the death penalty where they have now been years and years and years where they don't seek it and they don't execute people who are already, well, they do execute people 
before it is. That's part of the problem. Like in Georgia, they've had almost no new ex death sentences imposed, but they still execute people who were put on there in the past. Uh, one would think that in a rational society, they would say, well, if our standards of decency today are guided by what we would do today with a similar case, uh, that uh, then uh, maybe it could be the least of policy. But that has not gotten too far yet. So that's where I see things having been moving, where I've come from. It is very unsettled as to where it's going to go in the future. The one thing that seems pretty clear is that those who thought that the United States Supreme Court was going to hold the death penalty unconstitutional anytime soon pretty much don't think so anymore. I was not one of them who thought it anyway. But the new Supreme Court in a very novel way that thanks to Mitch McConnell, uh, the personnel have been changed in unexpected ways is not at all likely to do that. And they may cut back on some of the uh, rulings that have already been made. But there is a lot of room for action at the state level, maybe even in Congress, as the public begins to understand this issue, as the government in all levels is facing huge financial deficits and is trying to confront racial issues in different ways. Bringing attention to all the different factors that we have seen cause many Republicans and other conservatives to want to rethink the issue uh, gives reason to think that we may continue on a trend away from the death penalty that we've been in, but there's no way to be certain. Um, one of the chat questions, and a quick one, was in reference to the 13 people who were executed on federal death row. How many of those were black or brown? I don't have the numbers right in front of me. What I do know is that not by accident, the first three or four of them were white, um, but they then uh, started to have black people. One of the interesting things is that most of the constitutional argument that is now being made uh, is based on the discrimination based on the race of the victim. And to use a phrase that has now become part of our public discourse, the point that they are asserting is that the idea that black lives may not really matter is being implemented in the way the death penalty is being carried out. Now, one could say, and other people have said this before, oh, well, if that's the problem, then let's just execute more people so we get rid of the disparities. But uh, when you combine this with all the other issues, including the fact that under any study that anybody has made, uh, the death penalty process is far more expensive than not having one. You can see why there are leading groups of Republicans and conservatives that are saying that the death penalty is like a failed government program that doesn't work correctly. And if we'd like to see an example of this, George Will, uh, noted conservative writer, who every 10 or 15 years comes out against the death penalty for one reason or another, and then makes you think in between and change his mind back to favoring it, but his latest formulation appeared on the wires today. Uh, you can take a look and see what his reasoning is. But it's all using conservative lines of argument. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, I think the only other uh, thing in the chat box came from uh, Marty, who had as more of an uh, observation than a question. He said that it seems to me prosecutors are like baseball pitchers. The only thing that matters in keeping your job is their one loss record. Prosecutors do anything to win. Often truth and justice have little relevance. So do you uh, have any comment in response to that observation? I do have a comment. One is that the uh, phenomenon that uh, the way that death penalty cases have been handled particularly by prosecutors, but also by judges who are often elected, sheriffs who are often elected in a lot of these places, does seem to be more like a sports contest 
than a pursuit of justice, um, despite the fact that prosecutors have always had an obligation that defense lawyers don't have, which is to pursue justice. And if they find exculpatory evidence, they're supposed to report it. And um, what we have been seeing in recent times when statisticians and other experts have been able to show that the vast majority of our death sentence in this country, even when the number of, of death penalties was considerably higher than they are now, was coming from a very small percentage of counties, even within states like Texas that have a lot of death penalties. And then they started to focus on who some of the district attorneys were whose offices were getting the most death penalties and how much were they spending on it? Were they making mistakes? Were they sloppy? Uh, were they more than sloppy? Uh, were other people involved in it? And so you then began to get some of these reform candidates. Now, reform candidates don't always win. Um, and some of them, like this one in Philadelphia, who's under challenge for re-election and is the subject of a new PBS eight-part series uh, that just began, um, may be going a bit far in some of what they've done. But I do think that the general, in general, we should be praising the newer crop of prosecutors, at least the ones who say we want to look at these other cases. If, if we now have the ability that they didn't have before to do DNA testing, which is often still not usable, they don't have physical material on which DNA testing could be done. But if they do have the ability to use new DNA tests on existing material, they have been trying to systematically go through this. And there have been a lot of cases where nobody was claiming that the person was innocent, where they nonetheless proved that they were innocent through this DNA testing. And I think that that is a praiseworthy trend and that uh, it is unfortunate that some state attorney generals are opposing it. I think the courts and the public will have to look at this very carefully because the mere fact that you say a reforming VA doesn't mean you're the greatest thing since sliced bread, or that your predecessor was wrong. So you have to look on a factually based way. But I think if we do that, uh, we would want the most instances to be encouraging the VAs for no other reason as to deter people today from carrying out some of the tactics, uh, such as the use of informants, such as coercing people into confessions, things they didn't do, to going against people you know have serious about all this problem that nothing is said about, uh, having defense counsel not know what they're doing. Um, these are things that cry out for action. The American Bar Association has tried to expose this where it's founded, but it is a positive sign that conservatives, Republicans, and others are paying much more credence to this kind of activity and that the voters, when they're presented with a clear-cut case, often vote for the more moderate prosecutor. Okay, well, we're getting some more questions. And by the way, I, my experience in North Carolina, and Seth may uh, want to comment now or next week, is uh, supports what you were saying. Uh, there's a large urban-rural difference in North Carolina, the uh, uh, eager uh, prosecutors, uh, eager um, officials are uh, implementing the death penalty or in the rural areas. Okay, other uh, questions. Um, um, oh, the root of the problem is the social differences, the loss of the family and support services to give underprivileged persons of any race to succeed. Again, that's more of an observation, but um, do you have any comments on that? Well, the one comment I have is that I've long felt that if the mitigation cases, which should have been done in this original trial, but to most extreme wasn't, but if we took all these things that fall on deaf ears on the claim that it was too late, we should have done this at trial or in the first appeal, 
But if we pull together all these social histories, you would see that that person's comment uh, is worn out over and over and over again. The number of occasions when everything cried out for somebody to be given kind of help that they were not able to do, certainly happened with Corey, uh, but it happens with a lot of other people. It's tragic, but at least we ought to be able to make some use of this. And one hope we, that we have is that as the country continues, if it does continue, to turn further away from the death penalty and it starts looking at the causes of some of these crimes, um, and I think the public recognizes that mental illness is one of them, it's not the only one, uh, that maybe the evidence of what didn't happen in the cases that land up with people on death row may be used perhaps as a negative pregnancy to support different ways of treating people because we, we now have all this evidence of what doesn't necessarily happen. People always say, well, not everybody who had horrible childhood or some mother who beat them up all the time and been traumas goes on to murder them. That's true. There are exceptional people who are able to overcome that. But since we do have all this evidence, hopefully it can be used by scholars and others in the field for a productive purpose that benefits everybody. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, next observation or question, I guess, is, is there any discussion of how justice and revenge get confused? There is discussion of that. And um, the uh, argument that is made uh, by some that we need to ask what about the family of the victims in the case. That is an argument that is a not very subtle effort to look at revenge. But the fact of the matter, aside from the fact that it's never been demonstrated that waiting a large number of years and then in occasional cases having an execution does anything for the family of the victim other than cause them years of uncertainty, mm -hmm. um, in some cases it may help them. But when the Supreme Court gave reasons why it was upholding the death penalty, the two reasons it gave, which were showing great moral uh, disapproval of people whose moral conduct, whose morality as reflected in their conduct, was way below that of the average murderer. Uh, and it was only to those worst people in that regard. So people with mental illness and mental retardation, as it used to be called, would not come in that character because they didn't have the same ability to control what they did. So that was one thing. That's the closest they came for that. And then the other purpose they said was deterrence, which has been failed to be proven by any evidence anywhere. But they have never, as a majority of the court, advocated revenge as a sustainable basis for it. Although I have no doubt that there are people among those who favor the death penalty who always favor it because of the instinct for revenge. But I think when you look at what the Catholic Church is now saying, uh, what other churches are saying, what Judaism has said long ago, and others, that even when they sometimes can justify taking of a life, uh, revenge is usually not the justification it's given to it. Well, um, a related comment um, to what you just said. Um, is it not true that the cost of executing is greater than that of life without parole? I think you've addressed that. Well, I've addressed it, but i just add one detail. If one looks at the case of the person who is executed, and if you were to assume that his execution would take place within a few years, rather than after the many, many years, often with retrials before it takes place. There could be individual cases where the cost of executing and of incarceration before that is less than the cost of life without parole. However, when you consider the entire panoply of the cases 
including all the people they try to get the death penalty for, have these very expensive trials, often do not end up with the death penalty. Even when they do end up with the death penalty, it's often reversed later. So they wind up with all the expenses of the trials and still the expenses of life without parole. That is why every study that I've seen that has examined this has found that the death penalty system is far more expensive than the alternative. Okay. Next uh, question is, is there any measurement of one being reformed while on death row? Well, so far, it's been more uh, impressionistic in that when you see people like Pat Robertson and others, you remember the case of Call of State Tucker, who would, after being in prison in Texas for many years, was executed somewhere in the mid-90s. And she said that these people believed that she was a born-again Christian. And what the argument that Pat Robertson made was she should have been executed more quickly than she was. And I would have had no problem with that. But because it was delayed so long that she had the chance to reform herself, and she did, now I'm against it. Now, how logical that is, I'm not going to try to comment on. But I do say that there are a lot of people who tell you, including a lot of prison officials and guards, uh, who are among the most traumatized by this whole system, that uh, when they see people get executed, the person who winds up being executed is a very different person than the person who showed up on death row. But it's true of a lot of other people. And very often they're very upset about that, particularly because there are others who they say have not gotten better over time, but there are plenty of people who do get better over time. And the fact is that those who have served on death row who don't get executed have among the lowest recidivism rates of anybody. Um, and they can be a good influence on other prisoners. Not everybody. Uh, there are plenty of reasons to think of that. And it, we should care about the people we're dealing with. And they're not static. And uh, when people who are observing them day in and day out, year in and year out, uh, see that, okay, I could have justified, I would have been happy to pull the switch, they may say, put in the lethal drugs, on day one or year one, but not now. You're making me execute somebody who doesn't deserve it, given that they're the person they have become. And that is why if you have any belief in certain ethical principles or religious principles of the sort that says that you should atone for your sins, that God does not demand the death of sinners, but that they repent of their ways and live, um, now, we can't carry that to an extreme, but the general gist of that, which is a principle of many of our religions, is that not all of them believe in apologies or require apologies and forgiveness. There's a difference among religions in that. But if you have a religion that does think that repentance is very important, um, and even more so, if you have a religion that does believe in an afterlife, then to say that uh, we're going to execute this person anyway, even though God wanted to punish them for what they did before, God could still be second to the life, is questionable. And it simply brings to mind, if I'll leave something I'll mention in about 20 seconds, Justice Scalia tried to explain the difference between getting rid of the death penalty in most of Western Europe by early in this century and not getting rid of it most of this country by early in the century. On the ground that he said in Europe, they don't believe in Christianity anymore, and they don't believe in an afterlife. So if you make a mistake and you execute somebody and there is no afterlife, then that's a big deal. But he said, but if you do believe in religion and you do believe in the afterlife, then God can correct it all in the afterlife, so it's not a big deal to execute an innocent person. I kid you not, he did say it, I actually quoted from that when I got to be on a panel with a cardinal of Chicago who 
to this pleasure of Scalia's son, said that he didn't think Justice Scalia had, whatever it was, he was of the law, that he didn't really have the Catholic view of the death penalty down straight. Hmm. Well, okay. Well, we have no more questions, and somehow parting on uh, comments of Justice Scalia seems uh, oddly uh, appropriate. Uh, Ron, it's always a pleasure to see you and talk with you, and thank you for taking your time on a Saturday morning. Uh, and the residents of Carolina Meadows, thank you. And uh, personally, I'll look forward to being in touch with you in the future. Well, thank us everyone for uh, attending and have a good weekend.